Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Deep Thoughts. Today, we are going to talk about fake news. And I'm almost tempted to call it real news and reverse the whole thing and try to be clever. But we want people who are interested in fake news angles and perception to find the keyword. So we'll keep it fake news. Here's what we're going to do on this episode, and here's what we're not going to do on this episode. Firstly, what we're not going to do is really focus on any specific events in history where we know it was fake news. I will talk about a few events that are more in indicative of the species of how fake news is processed. But what we're, what we're going to do is look at what news is. The value of news in your life, in your circle of life, why you watch it in the first place. What are the desires and gains that you have in engaging in such a thing? And then we're going to look at institutions that started off good, but once a profit margin was introduced into the mechanism of news, they lost their minds. The corporations lost their minds and the individuals that work inside the corporations lost their minds to money and greed. Some of it was quite direct, and some of it, I think virtually all of it today, is very indirect. Fake news. It's a big concern, right? We know there's shit tons of it all over the world now. It's really tough to honestly refer an article to a friend, or to some Facebook page, or to speak about it in some YouTube channel, because... By God, you're not, you're not there. That's really the, the crux of it. You're not there, so you can't confirm anything. And what's interesting about that is that you have friends that you don't quite trust either. And all they're doing is telling you what happened at their house on Saturday night between the time of 7 and midnight. But let's dial back. News. News is interesting. What's the news, right? That's how you ask it in a paradigm. What's interesting about quote-unquote news is that it feels a little bit different than someone telling you in your personal life what happened around the corner. There was an old, you know, catchphrase or axiom, you know, that was like, what's the news, man? What's the good news? And you would greet each other like this in the 70s. And then it kind of went away and it was... Sort of interesting how at some point there was an abstract between, or I should say a divide between a human being telling you what happened and someone on television telling you what happened. The credibility was on TV. And your friend was to be questioned or not believed or yeah, whatever. At least that's how I've experienced it. Now the richest information I get today, uh, consequently, is from a human being. And for some, from someone who I believe has a, an incredible level of perception on reality, they are consistently correct in their observations as it relates to what I see with my own eyes. But what did man do before the news to begin with? Because it's very important to understand that before we put any value on truth in news as well as fake news. Well, early man didn't really have any concept for a plane of existence with cities way, way over there, and then they had their city here, right? The very first tribes that existed got comfortable in a jungle, got comfortable in a lush desert, you know, with like palm trees in one area and desert in the other area. But wherever we settled, our first incarnation as Homo sapien, we only knew where we were. And you got to remember that because that is the first lesson in the you know, perception of reality slash news 101. You had the halo of your, of your eyeballs. As far as you could see and as far as your brain was capable of conceiving of objects and events and timelines, quote unquote, in your eyesight, your frustrum, were you able to perceive anything? It's so important that you remember that. The reason why I say that is that we might be returning right back to that. So we got to know where we started, because we might end up coming back to something like that in the future, right? Okay. At some point, tribes gained enough population, gained enough real estate, that they then start setting up in different areas. 
And think about it. you got a tribe that actually reaches out and, and creates a city next door. So they know they've created a sister city next door. There's another water hole over there. There's more fruit over there. And now they kind of have a caravan, a trade caravan that goes back and forth between the two cities. Hey, we got a little more fruit this year. Well, we got a hell of a lot of water. Eh, so they trade back and forth. But imagine the first city that didn't expand. It maybe got big, but it didn't expand. And somehow someone walks out of the forest, dressed a little different, looks a little different. Maybe they have a spear. Maybe they have nothing. Maybe they have a bone in their nose, whatever. And the other people are looking at him like, oh my God, you just materialized out of nothing. And of course, there's this disorientation to perceive that there's actually a world outside of your world. Fast forward a little bit, and they figured out a way to communicate, either with hand gestures, etc. Perhaps even a seedling of their past was responsible for this other tribe going out, so their languages are very similar. But they, you know, at some point, they learn how to communicate with each other, and you have, for the very first time, a real sense of information that came from a far, faraway place to you predicted what was there, said, you know, or basically not predicted, but describe what was there. They bundle up a bunch of supplies and they go to the other location and they're welcomed at the other location. And wow, this person brought news of their village far away, of their group far away. And let's just add a little bit of romance to it because it, uh, it puts in a spin of purpose and value to news. One guy goes to the other side, treks across, and my God, he finds the most beautiful female he has ever seen in his life. And she agrees. He is the most handsome male. And they get married. They have tons of children. And life is good. And his entire life and her entire life, and even their kids, they go on and on about how important it was that someone brought them news that this other place existed. Now let's introduce a little variable here. For several centuries, people go back and forth, and because they are good-hearted, they don't war. They discuss what they see in different locations. They go out and scout water holes, and they work with their local politicians and chieftains to figure out how to distribute things evenly. And life is good. And then, perhaps, one of the groups breeds this devilish gene pool known as greed. And they find a massive water hole, and I mean a good one. And the water hole attracts livestock of all kinds, so the hunting is good. The water is big enough that fish exist in plenty. The water isn't salty like the ocean, so it can be drank immediately. And someone says, man, this is good. But that village, that tribe that discovers this great pool of resources is not as big as the other tribes. And they kind of feel intimidated. Maybe they're short in stature. But they realize that once they gain all these resources, something changes. Their people aren't so weak all the time, like North Korean soldiers, right? They eat all the time. Over a couple generations, man, the kids start getting bigger. And with a nourished mind comes a higher intelligence. Perhaps just pretending to scrounge and have those resources at their beck and call, they end up selling Tons of fish, tons of livestock. They always have fresh water. And so their banks fill up with money. They go from being cellular one to being Verizon. From the bottom to the top. But the rule that the tribes actually agreed upon was that once something is discovered, it's shared among all of the people. Because the more fortunate tribes perhaps have facilitated the growth of this teeny tiny tribe that may have started out, you know, a dozen homo sapiens and then it turned into two dozen and then three dozen. But when they discovered this great resource, it became thousands. The other tribes get suspicious and they come to the, the new budding tribe and they say, have you found 
a new way to make do with what you have? Or have you found something just recently that's allowed you to expand the way that we see you expanding? I mean, look at you guys. You have everything. And the chieftain has convinced his tribe to lie. Given them some raw, raw story about the preservation of their kind. Perhaps they're all the same species, but for whatever reason, they, they're the red makeup people. They're the red clay people. And all the other tribes are some other color. And so they all lie. Now the chain of news, the chain of truth, the chain of perception, the chain of reality, and all the above has been injured. Why would anyone lie in that village? Because there's technically profit in it. There's gain in it. They visit the other villages. After they put on their poor man's clothes, they visit the other villages and they realize how much people are struggling to eat. To have clean water. To have any form of currency to buy things. And they think they're lucky stars every day they go home. And for the first generation that works very hard to harvest and capture everything at that new resource, yeah, they can say, well, I toiled to make all this happen. I killed all those animals. I worked 10 hours while the other village workers only work four. So I earned it. But as that population grows and offspring are created, the offspring don't have to work as hard as their parents because, the, one, their parents have amassed a lot of wealth to begin with. They could pay someone else to do the job for them. But there are more people, so there's less there's uh, less work per individual. They don't have to work so hard. And then it turns into what we have today, which is individuals that say, well, I was blessed to be given this wealth, and now I wake up in constant fear of it being taken away from me. Now, how does this apply to news? I think there's a direct correlation. News was expected to be 100% truth when it first started, and God knows when it first started. We don't really know. Probably tablets made of stone, made of mud, advanced to some sort of paper. Obviously, the printing press came around, changed everything. And now, of course, electronic medium has created television, has created the Internet, etc., etc. You all know the game. Now, there have been so many acidic, weird formulas attached to news, it's going to take me a little while to get to each and every nook and cranny of it all, right? But the first one is the perception that we wake up insecure about our perception of reality. We're insecure. We wake up and it's not just enough information to know what's in your bedroom, what's in your bathroom, what's in your front room, how your kids are, how your spouse is doing, whether your car got ripped off in the middle of the night. It's not enough for some reason. You need more. And the only reason why you think you need more is because someone has told you a tale about another far-off land or another far-off place that's important to you. And so you feel like you have to dial into the world because you no longer see yourself as a human being in a home you see yourself as a tic-tac on the surface of a giant globe. At least some of you do. And you see yourself as this savior of reality. You need to know what's going on in Indonesia and Pakistan and Russia and Ukraine. You have to know what's going on at the EU and Africa and South America. You have to know. Even though you have no vocational ability to impact those zones in the world, you don't know anyone in those regions. You have no money to donate. You have no time to donate. You don't understand the geopolitical relationships between countries. You feel like you gotta know. Because knowing where the fuck you are ain't enough. When it probably is. Now, I'm not sure if newspapers... I'm sure this is the case, but I'm not sure when especially... But the idea of getting a newspaper, something printed, without some sort of advertising in it, that must be a long time ago, right? 
What were the first incarnations of news? <clears throat> and what is the difference between news and knowledge? Well, it's an interesting conceptual distinction, right? If, I, if you don't know the Greek, and you know it's back at, say, 100 AD, or 100 BC, excuse me, and here the Greek have, have plagiarized the living shit out of the Egyptians, but they've taken it further. They've earned some accolades because they've taken it further. They've been able to describe it in a way that most of Europe can understand it. And here comes a book, and it's teaching you Pythagoras' theorem, teaching you some geometry. In one way, that is news to your mind about how to do that, that this is even something that you can calculate, and it's news of how you could use that methodology to improve your construction capabilities or design capabilities or just think clearly. But there comes a point in time when you know all of the things that you really want to know that is your core critical mass to operate in life. You're able to make a living. You're able to protect your children. And then the thing that comes left, the thing that is left, excuse me, is current affairs. What's going on? How did we get addicted to current affairs? In my mind, the only way that current affairs budded was when the unexpected happened to a particular society. Taxes were raised. Raiders came in and pillaged. Perhaps they didn't take over the city, but they really damaged the city. And I'm sure the aristocratic, oligarchical, monarchical, layers uh, needed to, you know, figured out first, and we should probably get some word from that city over there, whether or not anyone dislikes us, or that country over there. And then they were able to protect themselves. Right? Now, we'll say in history, there's a very interesting thing that's happened in history, it happened with the Native Americans quite a bit, as per their own emissions. If you were to try to send someone to the city next door, and their job is to figure out what the sentiment is towards your city, to figure out whether or not there's any plans to take you over or battle you or do whatever. And you ask the question in the wrong manner. You will create, perhaps, a lie. What do I mean by that? Well, the way to really get the information is to not allow the city that you're going to, to, to know that you're there to get the information about your city. You merely live there. You mingle. You have normal conversations about everything, the price of bread, how life is going, how the weather is. You never, ever say anything about what you're trying to extrapolate out. Because the second you do, you insert the question, oh, what do you mean? What do I think of the other city? Well, what do you think of the other city? What do you think of that place? I never really thought about it. Should I have an opinion? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. And then the person has to make an opinion. The suspicion's there. And someone goes, well, if I really have to think about it, yeah, maybe I don't like them, you know? I never thought about it. Before someone asked me the question, I didn't care. See how subtle that is? Someone might find out that you're a paid informant of what's going on and if they don't kill you they feed you bullshit or they say uh, well you know for a price I'll, I'll get you 10 opinions I'll get you the opinion of that guy over there okay here's your gold and the guy can feed him crap the first film I wrote was about uh, Native Americans and it's kind of the old history and or I had a Native American element in it, and I started getting the old books written in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and a lot of the historians were saying, look, you know, we thought we were getting really good information out of the Native Americans, but when they started getting compensated for their knowledge about their race, one, they didn't want to tell the white man anything, so they weren't getting anything. Then they started getting paid for it, and they thought, well, someone probably told them the truth, but a lot of folks said, tell them lies and take their money. And because we had, you know, obviously strangled them into ridiculous reservations when it was their land to begin with, they took any money they could get or products or whatever. And so 
this moment when a straight line of total truth and news starts to fray is super multidimensional. And that is just an organic fray of truth, an organic corruption. There's a principle of mankind called the haves and the have-nots. It is probably the most acidic, corrupt thought that any human being can have. It does exist in many forms and in the way of injustice, for sure. But what's interesting is, is that when you travel the world, when you see these other you know, communities in the world, you see people without anything. And they don't know it, and they love their lives. There's been several documentaries on, on Netflix where some documentary filmmaker will go to the most remote village of the Philippines, the most remote village of Argentina, uh, Brazil, out in the forest, you know. And they're some of the most kind, wonderful, happy people. They just, they're packed with smiles the whole time. Africa, packed with smiles. I'm sure they have their disputes and what have you, and war from time to time. But overall, they're pretty good. But once you teach them that they're missing out, you infect their mind that what they have, which is plentiful, or I should say, is enough to sustain them every single day without any pain, without any disproportionate hunger, they have plenty of shelter, they can dominate the predators in their area. There's plenty of males and females in the ratio. It's good. But reporting what happens around the world to an individual area starts to get into this corruption of thought. How do you watch a sort of documentary special on Monaco and you live anywhere else on planet Earth and you don't see the craziness of money being spent in that little country? I am unaware of a country that spends more money and has more money than that little retreat for the elite. And sure, there's a Rothschild mansion here and a Saxe Gothberg, you know, castle over there. But not a whole city, right? So part of this news element can be related to your overall inspirational arc of gosh, look at those famous people in Hollywood. You know, all those stories of actresses and actors in the 40s, 50s who migrated to Hollywood, even 30s and 20s too, because of the tale of what was there. And thank God some of them did because we got some incredible actors because of it, right? So there's a positive element to it for sure. But once you can lure mankind to anything that isn't real, or the real has a quantity, and so you can take the overflow and trick them. You got an issue. You got a problem on your hands. As it applies to news, well, you have some information that people want to know. Perhaps it's a sports score, something incidental, something entertaining. And once you have them, you can do all kinds of things with them. Force them to watch advertising. Force them to read about articles that are anything but healthy for their mind. There's an analogy in, uh, I can give you about Los Angeles. At any one time in Los Angeles, there are one million actors looking for work. And that's a very specific number. Now there's only, you know, on any one given day, there's about 1,000 to 10,000 jobs available. And a lot of those are closed auditions where you can't get in unless you have an agent and a career. So once you start dividing the number of jobs available by one million, you start getting the percentage of your chance of getting a role. And so there's a lot of predatorial companies that try to sell the fantasy of succeeding to people that have obviously no talent, that don't have a grasp of what's going on. They've, they're unwilling to go to acting school, writing school, or anything, right? They just feel entitled to win, just like those tone-deaf folks that go on American Idol back in the day. So a lot of these folks get lured into um, 
kind of peripheral jobs that aren't good for them. The porn industry promises these girls, if you just have one video, I'll introduce you to my buddy, and then uh, he, you know, he produced this movie, and the guy's just like on the absolute fringe of doing anything credible. But when you're looking at going back home with your tail between your legs, or trying, that's how they're getting a lot of these people into these horrible things. Photo shoots they shouldn't do. Getting hooked on drugs. Just that simple. Get them hooked on drugs to ease the pain of losing, but to uh, get them to do things they shouldn't do. And it does produce a little bit of cash for them, right? So when the news can lure you in, the reason why I mentioned this analogy, when the news can lure you in for one thing but sell you a bunch of other stuff, it's sort of that algorithm. And that other stuff is starts to reveal, I should say, their agendas. So let's get into fake news. What do we mean by fake news? Mm. There's different, different species nowadays, right? Fake news from all the right-left paradigm brands were really news that was sent from sort of those who control any one particular country. You know, Eisenhower warned us about the military-industrial complex because it was taking over the way that America was run. And then there's a lot of three-letter acronym agencies that do the actual dirty work or actually brainstorm the more sophisticated agendas. And it used to be perceived back in the day as dominance of America over other countries. And so we, we wrote blank checks to all of these covert secret societies that Kennedy talked about because we thought, well, it's for the greater good of America. You know, screw those commies, those chinks, those jabs, those whatevers, right? And then we realized we had been had. The agenda was to create a pyramid structure within the country such that there was going to be a very small group of folks at the top that were all European. And I say that regardless if they live in America and were born in America, they see themselves as citizens of Europe and they always will see themselves as citizens of Europe. They do not actually have a, a molecule in their body of American pride. They have family, you know, blue bloodline pride. And America went from a dream of an actual destination with sovereign rights and alienable rights as the Republic dictates and the Constitution enforces to a business with a Dun & Bradstreet listing, right? Every single country, or sorry, every single state, city, town, province, whatever in America has a, a corporation attached to it. And that's because it's turned into a corporation. There's people at the top making all the money and all of us slave down below. And the system is designed to ensure that we are not capable of ever rising to their level. Not through intelligence and especially not through financing. And slowly over time, you guys know that once leaders rose up outside of the paradigm of political control, they were co-opted. You know, Martin Luther King was co-opted and then murdered. Malcolm X was co-opted and murdered before Martin Luther King. Bad substitutes were put in for those two men. You know, the white folk in America, well, we're willing to worship politicians and celebrities. So we were easy to control. We didn't even, we didn't perceive the need to have an outside leader of any kind. Because we're so stuck in yesterday paradigms, right? Sadly, one of the yesterday paradigms has to do with trusting human beings. But news in America, because I don't know anything about the news in other locations, really took off when it got to the printing press, right? Newspapers. And there was something called journalism. And journalism was this checks and balances where several individuals would check a claim. It wasn't one person. One person was never capable of saying this is true, and it got printed. You had to have multiple sources, multiple eyewitnesses. And then it started to uh, affect the way that 
businesses could run. Standard Oil Company, I forgot the, the woman's name, but Standard Oil Company was taken down by a woman in the 1890s who said, this is a complete monopoly. This has got to be broken up. And she was a victor. But she went and looked at it. And once they realized the power of an individual, which was something that they, they had realized this back in the Greek theater days, right? When Greek theater writers used to use their plays to influence the people against the politicians. Then the politicians would have the army kill the actors, kill the writers. You know, that's what TMZ is right now. You know, TMZ and all the paparazzi inquiry, or Inquirer magazine, Star magazines, they're all there to make sure that when celebrities gain the power to talk to the people, that they are marginalized beyond measure. And now we're inside something I'm going to talk about a little later, which is called pre-censorship, that Rod Serling, the inventor of Twilight Zone, told us about. Let's go back to the newspaper. There's a gentleman, I believe, his name is William Randolph Hearst, and he is known for being the first unequivocal lying newspaper printer. They categorized his form of journalism as yellow journalism because what ended up happening was is they realized that whatever they printed a newspaper, the settlers of America would read it and believe it and then spread it. And it went on for decades and decades and decades like this. Read it, and they spread it. Then someone wrote a lie on accident, and it spread, and it created a little bit of chaos. And they realized, oh my God, that was just something we had to retract off the front page because we thought it went one way, but it actually went the other way. And they realized, wow, that's an interesting phenomenon. You mean uh, when we print anything, people believe it and it creates hysteria or creates calmness? There's the Hearst Castle, Castle down by the coast in California out there in Monterey. And people go there and they pay money to walk around his castle. You were walking around a castle that was paid for by fake news. You're celebrating and financing the furthering of the idol worshiping of a, the first mogul of fake news. Not unbelievable. Orson Welles ended up hating the Hearst family for doing what they did. There's a lot of speculation that they played a role in destroying his career eventually. But he was a, definitely a, a, a contagious person to get along with if you disagreed with him. But he was a genius. But yellow journalism played a huge role in the establishment of the 16th Amendment in the United States of America, which for us is the formation of the Federal Reserve and the formalization of taxing the citizens in a way that is unconstitutional. Although in their tax code, for legal reasons, it says voluntary, right? It didn't get ratified, which means passed in enough states to be actually turned on. But while senators are being held at gunpoint in their respective states and respective caucuses to sign this thing. One, there was no journalism on that event, even though they protested in the streets later and saying, we, we didn't vote for this. We were held at gunpoint. Hearst got on the back of a train with Taft and with Woodrow Wilson and went all around the United States in a caboose, PR blitz telling everyone that the 16th Amendment was ratified and everybody I guess was happy I don't know because it was a Robin Hood formula 16th Amendment was promised to tax corporations and rich people but they had already written the tax code to make sure that they weren't going to get taxed they had corporate shelters plenty of loopholes my god the loopholes in 1913 were the size of you know a black hole the people got socked in the pants right away but William Randolph Hearst, what he did was he had, a, you know, some money. His father was, uh, you go see Deadwood, the series. His father was actually a silver and gold miner. So he gave his son tons of cash. They bought some big papers, established some big papers. But what ended up happening by 1913, he had an empire of newspapers. He went into every small town. He controlled the majority, as I understand it, the majority of United States newspapers. 
And so if you wanted to get anything to happen, you had to pay off Hearst. Like on the side, you had to pay him off. Now, meanwhile, he's selling newspapers and he's selling advertising in the back of newspapers in addition to help pay the bills, right? It was an opportunity, right? In a way, an advertisement is news, right? Well, I didn't know they had this new product. My gosh, I mean, I can buy this elixir and I grow hair on my face. Unbelievable. But that is the definitive moment in American history where the news was probably permanently corrupted because the richest people in the world had just taken over America through a coup de grace. Absolutely destroyed us. And so that was the name of the game. But they had this problem. They still had this resisting force called journalism and journalists. And this went on. According to an interview with Rod Serling in 1959, which you need to just look up, Rod Serling interview, there's only one on YouTube. It persisted as a problem until the mid-50s. And by the mid-50s, you had television evolving to replace newspapers. Although newspapers were always perceived as the way you get the in-depth story of what's going on. But when, you know, the network started in America, which you have to understand is it was like community service television. There was a camera downtown and people went down and stood in front of it and juggled and tap danced, right? And it took a while to establish the networks on air and to get a formula. And there's only so many broadcast hours in the day. At night, it went to a test pattern. Then it went to fuzz. That's where you see the multi movie Poltergeist in 82, right? But Rod Serling talked about something very powerful in 59. And he said that, they knew that they couldn't censor a journalist because that's against the Constitution of the United States. And that's against sort of the, the backbone of what these institutions are known for in terms of their value proposition to humanity, right? Bring me truth. What Rod started talking about was pre-censorship. Pre-censorship is to find sort of one of two things, sort of a dipshit or a sellout. But we can get both. You just win pay dirt, right? But you find someone who believes all the doctrine that they are told, and then you, again, you treat them like mushrooms. You put, keep them in the dark and feed them bullshit, right? And what they ended up doing was censoring the ability of anyone's intellectual capacity to see the truth. Now, the problem was is that they had individual news agencies in all the different regions of the world. And about 100 years before Rod's era, there was a little agency created called Reuters. Now, I'm, I'm unaware of exactly the sort of uh, infrastructure that Reuters had in 1850, but it was an organization founded in large part by the Rothschilds. And it, if you think about it, because you either walked outside and accepted reality for what you see, or you felt like you needed to read a newspaper, you felt like you needed to talk to people, or in our era, watch television, look at the internet. Back in that day, Reuters was tantamount to a reality beam of, re of all existence, right? They would write a story, pass it around the world as best they could. Of course, 1850s were not uh, quite stringing telegraph wires across the ocean. But they attach credibility to their brand. And for a while there, you just report the absolute truth. You have to report so much truth to keep the illusion going. And then you can sneak bullshit in there, right? I can't remember when the Associated Press came about, but that was another organization founded by independent journalists trying to report the truth. Now, I'm not sure if Reuters ever meant to do anything but formalize the yellow journalism that Hearst mastered over here. I don't know. But by the mid-50s, mid-1950s here in America, Rod Serling had identified that getting the truth out was going to become more and more difficult due to this pre-censorship mechanism. And he invented the series Twilight Zone to sneak truth through metaphor and themes out of his science fiction show. Because he, what he understood was the current affairs are important, but the overall theme of the and vector of humanity and morality is more important than anything at all. When you have morality, 
you have safety, right? Obviously, that's a very subjective concept, but thou shalt not kill. That's a pretty good starter, right? Don't steal from people. Don't watch out Walking Dead. I think that's one of the commandments. But then the news started moving into the 60s. And this is where, you know, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but this is all in one shot, which is nice, right? Marshall McLuhan was a philosopher that was really studying what he coined as medium or media. That's his invention, his characterization of what we have today. And what he said and what he warned about was the, the information is not as dangerous as the way that the information is brought to us. And what he was really talking about, this guy nearly lived 100 years. But he had gone from the newspaper day to the radio day to the television day. He had seen it all. And what he realized was that the credibility and infiltration into humanity, the more rich the medium became, it became more a priority in someone's life, right? When it was just newspapers, well, there's some guys that read newspapers, most people didn't. When it turned into radio where mom can be cutting carrots in the kitchen and dad can be cleaning the car out in the front, but you could have the radio on and hear things, well, then it became even that much more ubiquitous. When it turned into a television radio station, oh my God, just looking at people moving in a box was uh, the, the gimmick, which we can't recognize. It's less than 100 years old, people. Do you realize that people in the early 50s were still betting on whether or not television would continue? Obviously, it took off. With the internet is the amalgamation of all things. Written text, audio, news, and video news. And what do we have today? We have a new edition, which is virtual reality. Virtual reality kind of sucks right now. It does. The headsets are horrible. But wait till they become photoreal. And the processors become quantum processing. You will have infinite processing power. And you will have incredible resolution. And God help us after that. But it was the 60s and the 70s that transformed news from a more sterile, cold news to what sort of the Anchorman 2 was all based on, the movie, the comedy. It turned into 24-hour fluff news. It turned into a mechanism by which... Advertising was sold as a primary mechanism for paying for everything. Because a newspaper, you actually give some money away. And even the newspapers had to rely on classified ads and various advertising in the back to pay for the entire production. But Marshall McLuhan said something very interesting. He said, look, because he watched news go from having some barriers and having some standards. We don't report these sorts of things because it doesn't really matter to the rest of the world. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, according to my research, they didn't report about a woman being, you know, gang raped in the park down the street. Because that was her private business, and there's, she's already been raped. There's very little you can do. They might talk about a rapist that is on the loose, and he's committed some crimes, but the details of the crimes, the identity of the people, was never released, because we had some standards in this world. But they didn't report, you know, uh, a Central Park raping in Chinook, Kansas. There's nothing we can do about it. It doesn't help our life. But now it's the way to scare everyone and make everyone look. Just like rubbernecking on the highway, right? But Marshall made a very interesting observation about how news had gone totally acidic because Vietnam War was going on while he was just blowing up in the mid to late 60s. It was a great 1968 interview with Marshall McLuhan in Playboy. If you can look that up. If you can get to the end of that interview in one sitting, uh, you have earned an alkylade too, because it is deep and it is thick. Okay, but what he said was this. He goes, look, the reason why news is so acidic and so horrible, at least on one level, is that when the advertising comes on to tell you palm olive and whatever, you feel so good and so safe with palm olive. It is the teddy bear that you run to to get away from all this Vietnam War stuff, right? These horrible embedded videos of bodies you know, being blown to pieces. 
Now, I want to beat up something very specifically for the newcomers especially, and it has to do with broadcast speak. There's nothing more condescending and disingenuous than broadcast speak, right? When someone talks to you like this, or Wolf Blitzer, that fucking guy from CNN, Jesus Christ, if you want to see just the epitome of vomitous communication styles, go watch Wolf Blitzer talk. He talks like no other human being on planet Earth, and it's his shtick. And people actually tune in to, to have this sort of, you know, uh, it's almost like a, a voice box 1.0 out of a Timex Sinclair computer in 1975 trying to talk to you, right? That's Wolf Blitzer. But anytime you have someone talking to you like a salesman, like a broadcast news person, you need to stop them if they're right in front of you and say, stop talking to me like that. I'm a human being. Talk to me like a human being. Stop trying to pretend like you're a part of a bigger institution that has rules, right? What's kind of interesting is, there's a guy in the UK I really like, and I think he's very genuine and very real. His name's Paul Watson, and he reports for Alex Jones's show, Infowars.com. But Paul has bought into this, almost inadvertently, this broadcast speak. He's sort of a mix between Wolf Blitzer and normal broadcast speak. And he feels that that's, I believe he feels that that's a legitimization of his content instead of just speaking normally. I hope he can just chill out a little bit and just be Paul, you know. But we need to turn off any information coming at us through these mechanisms of tonal deafness, right? Because those people aren't real. It's it's almost like the movie They Live out of 1985 by John Carpenter with Ronnie Piper. Ronnie Pipe Piper. R.I.P. My, my brother. You put these glasses on, you can see the aliens that have infiltrated Earth and you see all the advertising that's um, actually a bunch of subliminal words that teach us how to do what we do, right? If you could just sense broadcast speak, if you can sense salesman speak, you've got the glasses that they had and they live. But it's just inside your head. You don't have to put anything on. Don't listen to it. And you know what? Be kind. But if you have the power to turn that shit off around your friends and family, just grab the remote and say, look, when I watch Friends, when I watch Game of Thrones or whatever, depending on how old you are, and I see people talk like actors and it's, it's, the, it's the sitcom shticky way of communicating, I accept that because I am watching a form of entertainment and it's sort of vaudeville on television. But when I'm trying to figure out what the hell's going on in the world, I don't want anyone talking to me in some bizarre robotic voice. And just point at the screen and say, look at them. Listen to them. They don't talk to us like we're normal human beings. They're talking to us in almost a condescending voice tone. And that, in a subliminal way, puts them at some professor level and we're at some student level constantly. So I don't think you need anything more than just that little litmus test to find out who you're going to listen to and who you're not going to listen to. But what makes up fake news today? Let's take a major brand. We won't talk about any one brand so you don't get pissed off. You know, think about a brand that you recognize as your brand for getting news. And hopefully you surprise me you don't have a brand that's shitty, but if it's one of the big three-letter, you know, acronyms out there, you know, some countries still allow their government to finance their their major news source. It's a government extension of their military-industrial complex, of their political parliaments, and that is fucking crazy unbelievable that they they know that everything being spoken on television is directly been censored by their monarchy by their politicians by their military industrial complex they know and they think they've got some freedom which is hilarious at least we try to get a, keep an illusion over here right but the news organizations that have come to the top, which is very interesting because the two big ones that are perceived as left and the right paradigms of choice, and pretty much most of their cousins, they're less than 30 years old. 
I mean, the, the actual brands are less than 30 years old. Some are less than 25 years old. But what do they, what do they sustain themselves on? Well, one, they use the pre-censorship that Rod Serling talked about. Two, they sell the living shit out of advertising. So they sell it on television. And they sell it on the internet. Could you imagine if television ads were as bad as internet ads? You know, these stupid galleries of, you know, they're all lies at the bottom of a page. They say they've got a gallery of one thing and it's not there at all. They even show you a thumbnail that you'll never see the zoomed up picture of. If that kind of crap was on television, I think it would expose a lot of the ridiculous nature of news to begin with, right? But now they build up something new. They build up personalities. Pretty much in the 50s it really started. But you have these individuals that are the people that you grow to trust. I got the uh, the quote wrong, and I want to thank the listener. Francis Bacon uh, was the individual who said, uh, I think one doth protest too much. Which I love that line, which basically means if you lament about something a lot, that means and you say this is the way you are, you're exactly the opposite. You know, fair and balanced, news you can trust, all that kind of stuff. Mm, don't be evil. <laughs> you know, okay. But now there is there are direct relationships between news organizations and political um, arteries of information. If you want to stay in the White House, you got to not piss off the White House. If you want to stay embedded in the Pentagon, you've got to keep the Pentagon happy. And let's just say everyone's embedded in the Pentagon. The Pentagon's happy with most folks, but in the end, the Pentagon uh, you want to, the Pentagon has other opportunities. And so you lobby to get further embedded and get further information inside the Pentagon. And they could be good and just give it to you, or the Pentagon could have a general or colonel that just looks at you and says, what are you going to give me for this, right? But I'll tell you what ends up happening here. At some point, these individuals measure the amount of trust that the people give them. It's not based on real truth, but they just measure. They go, well, how... What kind of loyalty do you have with your with your viewership? They say, well, you know, when this guy's on, it's unbelievable. He can say anything, and people believe him 89%. She says something, eh, it's about 69%, not too bad. And they go, okay. Well, we got some events coming up here. They're going to be really hard to digest. And, you know, we're it's an inside job, so what we really got to do is figure out a way to keep, you know, Look over here, a little uh, misdirection. So when it comes to, uh, let's see, September 11th, let's just say, we need your, and it's between the, the times of like um, 8 o'clock and say 11 in the morning. And if you could hold them all day, it'd be great. But there's going to be a lot of tough information coming out. And what we need you to do is just have that guy, your most trustworthy assets on on the air, Keep them the whole day. Make sure you're ready to give them what they need to stay calm within themselves. Because we're going to have a lot of tough information. We're going to give you a lot of feeds from cameras. It's going to be coming in. So just have your, your media center ready for all these alternative views of the day. We're going to ship them to your satellite. We're going to be running in with VHS tapes, quarter inch tapes, RAM drives, whatever. Get ready. And they're able to orchestrate things. It's beautifully, beautifully orchestrated evil. There's nothing special about a reporter. A reporter's an actor. They don't research shit. They don't ever go out and actually do anything by themselves besides maybe stand out during a riot or a hurricane or some bullshit. But they don't ask any questions. Any real questions. But they get worshipped, right? Today, we actually have one journalist out there that uh, is the heir of one of the families that was directly supported and financed by the Rothschilds. When he went through, after he got done, you know, being silver spooned, he did his internship at one of the three-letter uh, intelligence agencies and then became the number one anchor 
the number one celebrated personality on one of the news agencies. You couldn't, you couldn't come up with a more convincing story about a single individual going in to be a reporter for a national news organization than that organization. He's part of an elite family, Rothschild connected. I mean, 100%. Their family got rich because they were financed by the Rothschilds from the 1850s to today. He goes and gets trained by the one organization that is single-handedly responsible for destroying this country, and we're undoing that today, which is great. And then he goes into a major news organization, and he doesn't have to cut his teeth, man. He doesn't go off and report hurricanes for two years. He goes straight to the front of the line because Grandma's got juice. Oh, when he meets all the social demographics that, uh, you know, is of the age, right? I mean, they, if they could construct an infiltrator or a reporter that could sway people by hand, like an Edward Scissorhands type situation, they couldn't get a better result than this dude. But what happens to a news organization that has to pay its bills? If you want to create your own news organization, how would you do it, right? You got to pay the bills. You can't just make, you know, a 20,000 person staff and bet all around the world and have all these credentials and be able to fly and edit, you know, shoot and edit and report without billions of dollars of, of investment. Well, the, the actually silly way to do it, which would probably work better than what goes on, is to have the government allocate a certain amount of funds to fund independent news organizations without any involvement, with all kinds of laws about, you know, um, conflicts of interest and what have you. And the people vote whether or not that news organization is doing a good job. And if they get voted out for lying, everyone loses their job and a new organization is funded. That's a little silly, but that's, uh, that's one way to do it. But the other way to do it is to sell advertising. And the interesting thing is there's plenty of advertising out there that's decent. What's interesting about Europe is that Europe has had uh, advertising in a, in a bulk chunk format for quite some time. I think they've lost that format now, but there used to be a time when you had 20 minutes of ads and then you'd watch the whole show complete and then 20 minutes of ads. But the ads were, the ads had more integrity. You'd actually sit and watch them because it was kind of perceived as news. Oh, there's that new product. Oh, yeah, there's the new Mustang or whatever, right? But as long as the news organization is doing well, and the real news is bringing in the eyeballs and it's selling ads. Everything's great. But the second that there's a bump in the road and the ads, the numbers go down, then you might actually pull a few tricks out of your, uh, or out of your sleeve, right? Uh, I think I mentioned this once before, but since we're on this, there's the series on HBO that's long gone. It was uh, Carnival. It's about a carnival that goes around. It's, it's an amazing two-season stretch. It's, it's probably one of those perfect things ever created on television. But they have this time when they can't seem to find anyone to come to their, their carnival. And so the, the guy, the lead guy, Samson, pulls all the tricks out. And they create a bunch of, like they create a big a bunch of oddities and, and stuff using all kinds of props and stuff. And it's sort of like a gag night to get everyone to come and see it. And that's what happens with organizations when they're in dire straits, when they're having a problem. I guarantee you car dealerships that are having really bad time making ends meet, man, do they ever pull out every single stop in the book, swapping tires in the back after they sell the car, screwing people on all kinds of claims that the cars have, features that they don't have. Now, we've got protection agencies now a little bit better at helping out on that. Jewelry stores that will uh, say they're going to clean your jewelry after you pick it out of the, the case and they go and swap the diamonds in the back. And this is what happens with news. News goes crazy when they can't pay the bills. There's more murder, there's more rape, there's more stuff that doesn't relate to your reality when you wake up. We have news organizations online that are absolutely insane. They're completely fake. 
100%. All they're doing is selling advertising around fake news articles. The headlines of the news articles are written to just create curiosity, lacking the words to conclude what the article's actually about. They start off with ridiculous phrases like, you won't believe what so-and-so said. Don't click that bullshit. Just do me a favor, right? And then we have trusted names that have been out there forever, and they're lying their asses off nowadays. And what is their defense? Their defense is they, they, there's no way that a news agency can apologize for telling lies and survive. You just can't. You know, it's not like a marriage where you could say, you know, honey, I just slept with your sister, but I won't do it again. You know, you might have a chance in hell of surviving that, but a news agency can't survive that. And so now their big thing is they'll say that if a person says a, a news article is fake, their defense is you just don't like the truth. Wow. That's doubling down on the sin of lying to society. Right? It means that those organizations are so committed to their process of lying that they just don't give a fuck anymore. And it's, it's the reason to shut them down at with all due haste, right? It is the reason to stop watching them crush their viewership. Now, I know what some of you are saying. You're saying, well, hey, man, there are people out there that still believe that bullshit. Yes, you are correct. The only thing I can tell you that, that warms my heart about these individuals is that it's not a sustainable model, right? You can't bullshit yourself every single day of your life and actually sustain life. You can't. And so they are sort of in their own death spiral, believing in bullshit. Because let's face it, this country, since the assassination of John F. Kennedy, has gone utterly downhill with shilly fucking presidents, or in one case, I think a president that thought he was president for a little while and realized his vice president was the president. And suddenly... It's as if the train that's been on this fucking rail to hell has jumped the track, sprung wings, turbine jets have come out, it's been encapsulated in something can exist in you know, zero gravity and no atmosphere, and we are, we are off on a totally different vector. The only bummer is we have to take all these idiots with us. Just imagine, right? Imagine the news... On any one particular day, if, you, if you're not driving your car, just close your eyes and say, think about it, I switch on a new news program and every single person I'm listening to is talking to me like the dude I'm listening to right now. Just like a normal human being. And they're allowed to have an opinion. They're allowed to observe. They're allowed to be normal. When something's funny, they can laugh. When something's Sad, they can cry. Normal human beings. And they can insert a bunch of, you know, qualifications and say, well, we have been trying to figure out what's going on right here. We heard there was an explosion, whatever. We don't know exactly what's going on. Because we only have one witness, we're not sharing that information because it could be inaccurate. Right? You know, if any of you have been in business, there's the whole thing of uh, someone asking you what price you charge before they've told you the scope of their project. And they always do that. Those fucking wormy bastards that do that, right? To say, you know, like if someone will call you, hey, do you build houses? Yeah, I do. Well, uh, how much is it to build a house? Well, what are you, uh, you know, you're looking for 2,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet. Well, I just want to know how much it costs before I decide. Just hang up the phone on those people. Just hang it up. They're awful human beings, right? Well, the problem is, is you could even have a good person on the other side of the phone who's misunderstanding how the process works, and as soon as you tell them a price, they can't get that price out of their head. And the same thing goes with the eyewitness of one. You can never redo it. That's why front page news is so incredibly damaging when it's a lie, because no one reads the retraction seven days later. So how do we conclude this? It's getting long. Here's what I suggest. 
I want you to take inventory in your life of how goddamn important all this bullshit is in the first place. And in the way that you find out how important it is, is ask yourself, when have you been utterly surprised in your life at a point where it was just, oh my God, you know, uh, soldiers came into my house and, you know, held me at gunpoint and I didn't know what was going on. How does someone getting raped 3,000 miles away from you affect you personally? Do you really need to drag their entire family into the press and know their names and, and send them a letter so they can't close off the, can't get closure on the event? Do you really have to know all the gory details of how, you know, George Michael died? Do you really have to know? Is it your fucking business? Right? If they're dead, they're dead. Unless you have a machine that can bring dead people back to life without any weird, uh, you know, pet cemetery problems, then they're dead. And you obviously hope that the locals will take care of uh, any uh, wrongdoing. Now, I'm as guilty as anybody in wanting to know what's going on in the world, looking at the big picture. But I think that in if, if I could teach a class on such a thing, I would say, show me that you appreciate the life around you first. Show me that you're plugged into what's going on right in front of your face. If you have kids, show me that you're paying attention to them first. And then we can graduate into a 200 class where we actually start worrying about foreign affairs, about, you know, the state next to you, about the state that you live in. Because understanding the news requires that you have a vocation to understand it, right? People will pass around all this bullshit about, you know, the economy crashing. And yes, there's plenty of experts online that do this really well. But there's a lot of folks that will pass that misery and that negativity around, but they have no idea how money's created in the first place, how it has any value. When you say IMF or BIS or, or the World Bank, they have no idea, what you're talking about, but they got an opinion because they want to feel smart. I know you feel me. I just, uh, I wanted to put a finer point on the subatomic meaning of what news is and this faux level of importance it is for, for our lives and this idea that suddenly, you know, my English teacher in Kansas is a globalist and she's totally aware of, you know, and, and needs to know whether or not Italy is going to, you know, halt EU expansion. It's like we're all insane a little bit. It's time to sober up, man. Less is more. I could do a part two on this, but uh, we need to end this, baby. If you dig the series, please subscribe. If you like this episode, please like. All the feeds are at deepthoughtsradio.com. I'm not going to go on this particular time because I'm sick and tired of editing really long bumpers at the end. Take care of yourself. Enjoy the world around you. Refuse to listen to, to broadcast speak. Refuse to listen to salesmen speak. Let's, let's go out there and get humanity back, okay? Thanks for joining. See you in the next episode. Over now. 